on Thursday, last week, we talked about <clears throat> electromagnetic waves and geometric optics. And we discussed the ray model of light propagation. Our <laughs> now that we spent a class talking about the ray model of propagation, in other words, that we can we can present the propagation of electromagnetic waves as a series of plane oriented electric and magnetic fields that propagate along a particular direction. And that that propagation direction in some way represents what all happens. Now that we've spent some time talking about the fact that that's the case, I'm here now to tell you that it's not entirely the case. There are other behaviors of waves that are relevant for our understanding of the behavior of light. And our last two topics, interference and diffraction, are and related to that analysis. So, let's do it. The labeling here is based around the Young and Friedman text. If you're using a different text, then the chapter numbers will be different, but I do expect there to be a chapter about interference and a chapter about diffraction. And that's, that's our goal today. In these chapters, these are some things we will talk about. I'm not gonna read them to you. These are some other things we will talk about on the next slide. I have a couple pieces to talk about by the way of motivating our interest in these topics. Why do soap bubbles display different colors? The bubble solution in the bottle is not different colors. It is all essentially clear. Why do soap bubbles and um, uh, automotive oil on a puddle of water, why do these evidence color patterns? What's going on? We know from our discussion of dispersion last week that from the stimulus of um, multiple frequency light, in other words, white light, that if we're able to resolve individual colors, which is to say frequencies, which is to say wavelengths, if we're able to resolve individual wavelengths, there is some dispersive function going on here. So we expect this to be some sort of wavelength phenomenon based on our discussion last week. But what's what's the story here? This is a picture that I took from Wikipedia, giving credit where it is due, of a metal member that fractured. The 
dark sort of striped region here, it was the slow formation of a fracture. And then it failed and the sort of larger, brighter uh, cleavage there was a, a sudden failure. Now that it has failed, we can ascertain the extent of the repeated strain that the repeated stress caused. This member was subject to forces and those forces were presented, sort of manifested as stress. The stress is related to strain according to the modulus of material. This is all back from 231. But this is all post failure. Suppose, suppose I were interested in ascertaining the structural integrity. Mars has been in the news a lot. The uh, Ingenuity machine has had to power down to save battery life, but the Perseverance rover is, is still okay. We're going strong, but I, it makes me think about space. So then, and suppose we, we, we start talking about these. Oh, wait. Is that ingenuity or insight? I forget which one's which. <laughs> insight or ingenuity is the new one. Whichever one is new is is doing okay. Flew uh, yesterday, and in in the first example of a powered flight on another world, another planet. Kind of kind of incredible. Um, I. I forget who it was that was telling me about the fact that there's um, somewhere somewhere in the in the housing of ingenuity there's there's a um, a, p a small piece of the fabric of the original Wright brothers um, flying device. there on, on Mars doing remote powered flight on another planet. Really sort of mind boggling accomplishment. Anyway, space, has been, <laughs> space has been in the news here lately and it makes me think about space shuttles. So we, we, we're, we're doing all this, um, all this stuff for the economy of space, right? We're trying to get it so that we can take payloads to space and then bring the rockets back and, and reuse things, right? The, the shuttle, right, gets reused. But that means we have to make sure that it is still of good integrity when we get it back. I, I don't want to have to break it, like in this picture here, in order to ascertain how much stress and, and it was subject to and how much strain resulted. I would like to perform a non-destructive analysis on the quality of all the welds, for example. Is there a way to leverage the wave behavior of light to do that? That these are our questions for the day. 
first. Let's remind ourselves about superposition. It's not really like we needed another name for this phenomenon, but when we say interference, we just mean that there's one or more waves trying to be, trying to propagate at a particular point in space. And the superposition of those wave functions results in interference. It's possible that they could have, they could both have, maybe they both have maxima at this spot in space, such that one has a maximum and then the other also has a maximum. So the total, let's say it's an electromagnetic wave. We're interested in the electric field. If the electric field is maximum according to two different propagations that both get to the same spot, we just we have always added the electric field of multiple sources. So here we are adding the electric field of multiple sources. That could result in a greater amplitude than the original amplitude of either one if they arrive in phase. Let's consider a single source. And we said last week that we can model the propagation, the spherical propagation as uh, spherical shells or in two dimensions so that we can draw it, circles, ripples propagating on the surface of the water, you can think. The spacing between the wave fronts is the wavelength. You said that last week. And the wavelength is related to the speed of propagation and the frequency and so on. What if there's more than one source? <clears throat> We could just take the picture that we just had, grab that, copy it, translate it a little bit, and then paste it and call it S2. And that's what we've got here. We take the picture S1 and then paste it a little bit further down the page, and that's S2. And the, the combined effect, the additive effect of the two propagations is just the result. We superpose. The sources themselves are in phase. They have maxima at the same time and are the same frequency, which means since these waves are propagating in the same medium that they also have the same wavelength because they have the same speed. So the wave fronts are equally far apart and there is only one wavelength to worry about because we're using monochromatic light. Point A is equally far away from the two sources that means whatever is happening at point A as a result of source one, there's a certain number of wavelengths between the source and point A. Those That certain number of wavelengths, not always integer. In this case, it looks like it is. I'm counting one, two, three, four blue circles away from the source. <clears throat> but we could have put the point uh, here, halfway between two blue wavelengths, or anywhere with respect to the blue wave fronts. And that would give us phase information, whatever fraction of a wavelength is related because we're attached to the frequency is also related to the phase information in time. 
Okay. Point A, because it is equidistant between, well, equidistant from the two sources, we could also count one, two, three, four wave fronts from source two. It's just like the, the, if you're blue, green, colorblind, I apologize. The green wave fronts are from source two. And since A, point A is equally far away from either, whatever the phase is at A as a result of S1, it's gonna be the same as a result of S2 because it's the same propagation distance, which means it's the same phase because the two sources were in phase to begin with. When the phase agrees like this, we say that there is complete constructive interference. We just add the two waves, we end up with twice the field we would have had. However, consider point B in the same picture. Now let me go back. <laughs> this point B and consider this orientation of, it's the same diagram, just we sort of extract the relevant geometry for point B. If we counted wave fronts, there would be seven on the way to B from source one and nine on the way to B from source two. These do not have the same path length, which means they don't have the same, I'm gonna make up a name, they don't have the same phase length either, but the path lengths differ by an integer number of wavelengths. So yeah, it's the seventh successive maximum away from source one and the ninth away from source two. It's still a maximum. We still have an integer number of wavelengths. So whatever the phase was, we haven't changed the phase because we haven't moved to a different corresponding point in a wave cycle. Here again, we have constructive interference. The phases agree. Let me go back. Third point, C. And we extract the relevant geometry from the two sources for point C. Now, you can see that even though point C is relatively close to a blue wave front, it is about halfway between two green wave fronts. It doesn't actually fall on one of the green wave fronts. So what does that mean? Oh, and it's not quite a full, oh, it's close, but it's not spot on. Nine and three quarters, which I guess we are supposed to believe. <laughs> because I couldn't uh, ascertain that precision, but okay. Suppose that that's true. Now, the difference in the path lakes is a half integer. If it's 2.5, it's five, not five lambda, but five halves lambda. It's an integer number of, it's an odd integer number of half wavelengths. Yeah, okay. A half integer number of wavelengths. Now, a, a half integer number of wavelengths is also a half period cycle of phase. The argument of the sinusoidal function is advanced halfway through the period of the cosine function, which means that where we did have a maximum, now we have a minimum. Maybe we don't have, we don't quite have a maximum with respect to source one. We don't quite yet have a minimum with respect to source two, but as far as the phase angle between the two incoming waves, the phase angle between them will be 
180 degrees. Well, actually it's um, whatever 2.5 is times 180 degrees. Well, that's not quite right. It's whatever five times 180 degrees. 180 degrees would be half a wavelength and we have five of those. So whatever the math there is, 900 degrees. There is a, a phase difference that introduces a minus sign. Whatever one is doing, the other has the opposite if we're talking about a half integer number. And we call this destructive. Let's go back to the original picture. We could collect all the points in this 2D space for which there is constructive interference. If we think about, if we borrow the language of a standing wave and talk about nodes and anti-nodes, an anti-node is the point of largest superposition. A node is the point of most destructive superposition, where the amplitude is approaching zero. So the antinodal curves are these loci of complete constructive interference. The x-axis is also an antinodal curve. And that is the line along which there is no path difference. We could say that the number of wavelengths by which the path lengths from one source and the other to this point differ is zero. The number of wavelengths m and we'll, we're going to come back to this idea of M and talk about the order of path difference. We can say it's of order zero, order one, order two. And what we mean is M is zero, one, or two. If the path difference is twice the wavelength, then we're talking about M equals two. And that's exactly what we had when we considered point B. In practice, we don't usually make a big distinction between positive and negative orders. Uh, M equals plus or minus one is, is such that the path difference is an integer wavelength. Uh, from one or the other, it's a wavelength longer than the other one. But the whole the whole situation is is symmetric, so we could just flip it upside down and re renumber the orders, and not be able to tell the difference. So in in practice, I wouldn't usually talk about negative orders, negative values of m, um, but I understand why we're doing it here because we need to talk about the fact that both of these are um, a wavelength away but closer to one or the other. There's no inapplicability to this idea, interference is a property of waves generally, whether that's surface waves on the, the well, yeah, 
<laughs> surface waves at a boundary between media, like between water and air, the, the ripples on top of a pond, whether that's uh, waves on a mechanic, you know, mechanical waves on a string, or whether that's light or sound or whatever you like, any wave, any periodic propagation of energy through space. is subject to this behavior. Suppose we simplify the analysis and restrict ourselves to linear propagations. If we followed only the ray model of propagation, we might expect, didn't do that. <laughs> we might expect light to leave one aperture, one slit, pass through this other slit labeled S2, traveling in a straight line from here to here to the screen and have that be the end of it. If, if all we were interested in is the ray propagation, we would just have two spots, one spot here and one spot here. But that's not what we get because the ray model isn't a full, fully functioning model. The interference of waves created by propagation from the two slits is a pattern of light and dark bands or fringes is, is a word that shows up a lot. This is, imagine that this is the picture you would get if you put a screen right here. If this is light and the intensity has to do with, all right, wait, hold on. The two electric fields interfere constructively along an antinodal curve. That means the amplitudes add, and that means the intensity is increased and intensity and brightness for our, for our perception are related. So along the antinodal curves, where those curves are, you know, impinge on a screen, we will see the brightest reflection from that screen. Remember, because we don't see the screen itself, we see the light that hits the screen and reflects back into our faces. but we get the most screen reflection when there is the largest intensity incident on that spot. That's the antinodal curves. So we're gonna get a bright spot here and here and here and here and here, but we'll get dark spots along the nodal curves, which are not drawn, but we could find one. It's halfway between generally. Anytime we've got a wavelength from one source that is halfway between or a wave front from one source that is halfway between wave fronts from the other source, we've got destructive interference. Anytime there's a half integer path difference, we've got destructive interference. So not only will we get a bright spot here and a bright spot here, but we'll get a dark spot corresponding to almost perfect destructive interference here. And there'll be kind of a, uh, a brightening as we get closer to one of these maxima, but there'll be a minimum here and a bright spot there. That's what we're showing on this screen.
Okay. This all makes me think that the geometry of the sources and the screen permits a relationship. Like I could use this measurement with the screen Suppose I knew the wavelength. I could use this as a way to measure maybe the distance between the two slits somehow. If, if I can leverage the, uh, the geometry the right way. If I knew the wavelength, maybe I could use it to measure the distance between these two slits, S1 and S2. Or maybe if I knew that, I could use the interference pattern that's created to measure the wavelength of the light emitted by a particular source. I, I don't know, I'm spitballing. In order to make this geometrical analysis that I'm referring to, the only trick we have to play is to restrict ourselves to the scenario where the screen is very far away from the two slits. In that situation, we're discussing what we call the far field um, response as opposed to the near field response when the local geometry uh, makes an explicit derivation much, much harder. If we restrict ourselves to the far field, we can leverage the geometry of the situation to argue not that we have to worry about these these are different triangles. This angle theta, wait, there is a, this angle theta and the angle of this ray and the angle of this ray are different, which means we need to be very careful when we talk about the path differences in order to um, ascertain interference. <clears throat> if we put the screen far enough away that these two rays from one slit and the other slit drawn to a particular point on the screen are coming from so far away that they're essentially parallel. Like light rays coming to the earth from the sun. They're so far away from the source that by the time they get here, we, we can't resolve the angular difference between one and the other. It's just, it just is like a parallel rays of light. Okay, well that means that if the screen is here, right at the edge of the diagram, this line and this line are differently long, according to, now, angle here is adjusted. So you could imagine a, a vertical screen as we showed in the previous picture. Um, the difference in the lengths of these two rays is only this extra bit at the beginning. Where theta is originally defined as the angle between the horizontal, the center line between the two slits, the x-axis in this picture, the angle between that axis and 
the point at which we are observing the interference. This ray is going to hit the screen over here. That point, that propagation direction makes an angle theta with the center line. Turns out, geometrically, that angle is related to the extra path difference. It's a similar triangle here. This angle is theta, and this length is d sine theta. So the path difference between these two rays to some point, distant point p at the screen, is just d sine theta. So we will get constructive interference anytime d sine theta is an integer wavelength. Anytime d sine theta is half integer wavelengths, we'll get destructive interference. The difference in phase between two waves arriving at point P, let's call that angle phi. The phase difference between the two, the, the sum the amplitude of the resulting electric field that exists at point P <clears throat> is E cosine Kx minus omega T plus E, same magnitude, same phase and wave, like same initial phase and same wavelength. So same wavelength, same frequency. So still Kx minus omega T plus phi. If we ask about the amplitude of that sum, the sum is it'll still have a kx omega t it'll still have an oscillating well actually the kx will cancel but the omega t will survive it'll still be an oscillating electric field at point p if we're talking about at point p then there's no traveling we need to worry about the kx piece will be uh, constant somehow the algebra of the sums and differences of cosines will yield us the absolute value of the cosine of half the angle by which one wave is phase different from the other. Cosine of half the phase difference, absolute value of that because amplitude can't be negative. The possible total amplitude is twice the amplitude of the original waves, but we're going to modulate that by cosine of a phase difference. The electric field at point P will still oscillate, but it'll oscillate with this amplitude 
as opposed to the amplitude of the original sources. <laughs> and we thought we were done with phasers. <laughs> One way to keep track of that fact is to represent the sum of two electric fields as phasers, where one of them, now in this case, they both have the same amplitude, but they are phase shifted by the phase angle phi. The resultant wave, think about the law of cosines. We could use the law of cosines here. If this angle is phi, this angle is 180 minus phi, 180 degrees minus phi. And we could use the law of cosines to prove that this is the resultant response with a little bit of trig identity thrown in so that we can express it in terms of cosine of phi over two. That whole orientation all has a periodic phase uh, increase associated with the phasor rotation uh, omega t. This whole thing is gonna rotate in circle with angular frequency omega. This vector sum is drawn in Pythagorean notation instead of tip to tail, but the same, the same sort of statement applies. In this case, the angle between blue and red is as a result of the phase difference between two, the two source waves arriving at point P. The angle here between blue and red is the angle phi in this picture. The blue, oops, the blue phaser here is of smaller magnitude because we reduce the field from the other source according to, we only need the component on the x-axis, the projection, and the fact that we've added this additional angle phi means that the projection onto the x-axis is reduced. It's the same phasor diagram we've had before. As we move around in the XY plane here, we end up at different points. Those different points are experiencing two waves incident out of phase according to the difference between the paths from the two sources. The differences in phase imagine taking this second vector e and pausing the phasor diagram and then taking that second vector e and rotating it around depending on what the value of the phase difference phi is. Then, once you've got that second vector E in its configuration, suppose 
uh, I guess as you're looking at the diagram, uh, it looks like this. First vector E comes up and to the right. Second vector E goes steeper up and to the right. But if we change it so that the angle phi is greater than 90, because we're interested in the angle between this direction and this direction. So if we make that angle obtuse, the sum will be very small. The vector sum will just be this component over here. That amplitude will be the amplitude of the result. And we have partial destructive interference because the amplitude of the result is less than the amplitude, the original amplitudes from the sources. That amplitude then becomes the amplitude of the phasor rotation. The electric field at point P still oscillates with that amplitude between a maximum and a zero. Intensity goes like the square of the field. So we square the field and we end up with the amplitude intensity, the maximum intensity in the pattern is twice the amplitude of the superposed electric field, which was 2e. So we square that and we end up with 4e squared. So that's where that's why we're saying that the maximum intensity is four times what it was from each store, excuse me, each source individually. The phase difference, remember. is a result of the difference in path lengths, which we've got here, R2 minus R1 is the actual path difference. We were talking about that as integer multiples of lambda. Suppose R2 minus R1 is equal to lambda. Suppose we have the M equals one, the first order constructive interference. The lambda associated with the path difference will cancel this one and we'll have two pi. The phase difference between the two waves will be two pi radians, which just means that we're back in phase again. Suppose the path difference were the zeroth order destructive. No, hold on, let me go back. Because of the way we're expressing it, m plus one half, the first time we get destructive interference is actually for order index zero. Zero plus a half times lambda, that's our first instance of destructive interference for two slits. Okay, so wait a minute. If the path difference is one half lambda, oops, too many, R2 minus R1 is one half lambda. The lambdas cancel and we've got two pi times a half, which gets us pi, which gets us the 180 degrees of phase shift that ends up with full cancellation. Two pi over lambda is an expression we've seen before. That's just the wave number. which is nice. The argument 
of the traveling wave kx minus omega t plus phi. I really need phi to have the same dimensionality as kx, which, yeah, it does, because we've got kr, or delta r, I suppose. This is wave number k times an actual distance. That's the same radian argument that we've had all along. This, this is good. We asked about soap bubbles. If a soap bubble preferentially appears one color at a particular spot when illuminated by white light. There, there, we know that there's some dispersion occurring. And we know that there must be a, there's, there's a wavelength component because we, we were just talking about it. We are seeing the preferential destructive interference associated with the frequencies of light that we do not observe. We have full spectrum visible light incident on the soap bubble. What we see is the reflection. We talked last week about how there is reflection from the boundary between media, between the air and the, the thin soap layer. Light would travel with a different speed in soap. And so there is a boundary there which would result in, generally speaking, reflection and transmission, but that's probably refracted, probably bent a little bit. The hiccup here is that there is also reflection from the other boundary from the second boundary between the soap film and the other air, the, <laughs> the air inside the bubble. That reflection has traveled through the film and back, the soap film, which means that by the time it reaches our eye, that reflection has traveled a different path length than the reflection from the outer boundary. All right. So we're talking about a path length difference. Fine. Here, variable T is not time, it's thickness, the thickness of the film. There's one other one other hiccup.
anytime we are incident upon a boundary between media. If we are going from a medium of greater index to lesser index of refraction. In other words, remember that index of refraction is inversely related to the speed with which the light travels in the medium. N is equal to C over V. So if we travel faster in the second medium, material B in this picture. If we travel faster there, the index of refraction, bigger denominator, the index of refraction will be less. So we're going from greater to lesser index of refraction. Yeah, there it is. Cool. Uh, there is no phase difference associated with the reflection. We have at the boundary, the incident wave has something like a maximum. If we track the reflection, it also has a maximum at that spot. There is no phase difference introduced in the reflection. Imagine that you're that you're walking along in the very shallow end of a pool, like the, the end that's for little kids. That's only like a foot deep. So you're walking and your your feet slosh through the water, but you're able to walk walking along in the shallow part. And then there's a step down in the pool. So now you're walking through, let's say the water is now up to like your torso. That's gonna act to slow you down, right? You're less able to wade through water that's really deep like that than you were just to kind of splash, splash through the shallow end. That's like the second picture here, where we're going from a material in which we travel quickly to one in which we travel more slowly. It's gonna to act to slow you down and it's like hitting a wall. There's resistance to your propagation more than there was a minute ago. It's like hitting a propagative wall. Like what happens when we have a string fixed at one point and we send a disturbance along, it hits that wall and flips underneath. We looked at the video that I recorded on my phone last week. I'm almost positive. I'm getting a little bit confused for which classes I showed the video and for which ones I didn't, but I'm pretty sure we talked about it. Transmitting across a boundary fast to slow is like having a, a wave propagating on a string that reaches a fixed end. Newton's third law, when the tension in the string pulls up, the wall pulls back down and flips the reflection to the underneath of that string. That's what we're showing in the second picture. There is a 180 degree phase shift associated with a reflection from the boundary between low to high index of refraction. If we're propagating from high to low index, that's like we were wading through with effort through the really deep water. 
and then we got to step up so the water isn't so deep and it's a lot easier to walk through there's no it's almost like i'm, I'm almost trying too hard <laughs> i just kind of keep going now there's less resistance all of a sudden acting on me and there's no it's not like hitting a wall it's like I don't know, not hitting a wall. <laughs> and, and now something in my brain has made me think about back when we used to go to airports. At large airports, you sometimes have these big conveyor belts that like, like the conveyor belt at a grocery store checkout, but for people. So you're, you're walking through the, the terminal and you have the option sometimes to step onto one of these conveyor belts and keep walking. So it's like you're walking with speed, large index, and then you get onto one of these conveyors. And if you keep walking at your speed, you'll end up moving faster. It's easier to get farther in the same amount of time, even though your step frequency is the same, it's easier. And there's no... resistance to that there's no there there is no point at which your forward step is impeded by your transition onto that conveyor belt there's no point at which your forward step when we're going from deep water to shallow water is impeded which means Newton's third law never becomes relevant. There, there's never a point at which we're trying to do a thing and something's pulling us the other way. So there's no need for that phase reflection. All right. From air to soap, that's low to high index, we will get a phase shift from that reflection at point B. The boundary between soap and the inner air, that's high to low. There won't be a phase shift there. So Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. From low to high, we get a phase shift associated with the reflection. So at point B, we get from the reflection, we get a 180 degree phase shift relative to the incident wave. The incident, the transmitted wave continues. Note that it is in phase with the original incident wave. From point A, the wave that reaches point D is in phase with that original incident wave. We reflect at point D, no phase shift. We propagate back through the medium, we get to E. And now here again, we're going, well, we're, it's the transmitted wave. So there's no, well, I'm not worried about the phase shift anymore. Maybe there is a reflection and I, I guess it bounces back, but that's not, I'm not interested in that anymore it's still true that there would not be a phase shift associated with the reflection. But what we've got are two rays, one coming from point B and one coming from point E that are phase different for two reasons. One reason is the 180 degree phase shift associated with the fixed end reflection at point B. And the other reason is the differences in path lengths.
the example we were just looking at is this kind. That's the soap bubble that we were talking about. Only one of the reflections has the phase shift associated with a fixed end. Nailing the string to the floor at that point, a fixed end. That's more like this picture. We've got a half integer phase shift associated with the reflection. So if we had another half integer phase shift associated with the passage through the thickness of that film, in other words, if down and back through the film was half integer, that half integer would add with the other half integer from the reflection and end up with a total integer difference, which would get us constructive interference. If the, on the other hand, if the path difference through the film and back was an integer number of wavelengths, then we've got only a total half integer because of the original half associated with the reflection at point B. So now we've got destructive. When would it be the case that neither or both have a half cycle shift associated with a reflection. Both is the one I'm thinking of, and that's oil on water. If we've got air to oil, thin film of oil, and then we're incident on the boundary between oil and water, instead of between air to soap and back to air again. From air to oil, we're going from lesser to greater index. So we get a phase shift. And then from oil to water, again, we're going from lesser to greater phase shift. So we're going to burn up lesser to greater index. So we'll get another phase shift. So both reflections, the reflection that leaves from point B and the reflection that leaves from point E, will have undergone phase shifting reflections. So the only thing I care about is the path difference associated with the propagation through the film of oil. So now we're back to like a D sine theta equals M lambda. I care about the difference in the path length, which in this case we'll argue is just twice the thickness down and back. If that is integer wavelengths, we're back to constructive. If it's half integer, we're back to destructive. Even though there is often glare off my glasses, there is supposed to be a non-reflective non coating on the lens to minimize the extent to which you can see reflections in my glasses when I'm wearing. A non-reflective coating is the film between the air and the glass, the material of the lens. If we've got an air film glass order of index of refraction, just like we had for air, oil, water, Then wait. 
then we're in this first box scenario. And if we want destructive interference such that the reflections are minimized, then we want the thickness to be a quarter wavelength. That's the thinnest film in this scenario for which we can achieve non-reflection at the particular wavelength in question. Yep, we've been talking for a while. Let's take a break. <laughs> 